You're listening to this week's message from the Sunday Preview, a version of OSL's own The Shop podcast, where we discuss life, the faith, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the modern world. It's real talk about real faith in the real God. All right, folks, welcome back to Sunday Preview. We're looking at the readings coming for June 26th, the Sunday coming up to June 26th. Uh, so it's we're in the middle of summer. Today's June 21st, so technically first day of summer, right? Is that what the news said? Is it? I think that's what the news said, but I think in Texas we've been living summer for quite a while. So, And for all the astronomy fans that listen, apparently if you go out in the morning now, all the major planets are lined up. See, how do you know if you're looking at a planet in the sky, does it look different like as a star, or do you need a telescope? You get an app that you... <laughs> So you look through it, your phone too. Well, you, yeah, it does. True. You can hold your app, your phone up, and it'll just, it'll tell you what each one of those little planets are. It's not using your camera to see. No, it. no, no. Oh, it's just no. It, kind of sign. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say, my gosh, yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Interesting. My son wanted a telescope, and we're like, dude, you go to bed too early. <laughs> I'm gonna tell. Well, this is this is like an early in the morning, so maybe this is oh. work for him. So, of course, he's now preteen, so getting up early in the morning uh, now that's the battle. Gets up at noon. Yeah. All right, so let's look at our reading. So we're going to be in First Kings, our Old Testament reading is First Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 21. And David, you and I were talking yesterday in our other podcast about how sometimes Old Testament text doesn't have, like, we're like, what's the point of this? What am I supposed to get from this? Whereas this one, I think there's a lot in here. There's a lot of layers of depth and meaning and what's going on. So we'll jump right into this. The, tech, the, highlight, the section of this says, the Lord speaks to Elijah. So I'll give you an idea there. So there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat and Abel Meholah, you shall anoint to be a prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elijah, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the auction and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. So big section of text here. So basically, you have Elijah the prophet, God's prophet, who is exhausted in his work. He's getting beat down by the people that are being stubborn, that are going against God, and he's expressing that to God. And God shows him a period of his, uh, I don't know, maybe law, maybe a little bit of wrath and what he's doing in this breaking of the pieces of the rocks and the earthquake and showing all his power. And then he whispers softly to Elijah, and then leads Elijah to some replacements or uh, what's the what's the relief pitchers in the ministry to come in and, and carry on the ministry and, and the pointing of repentance and pointing back to God. 
Um, so that's kind of the gist of it. So, David, what are your initial thoughts here? One thing that strikes you immediately, just the context of Elijah's just experienced this great victory against the prophets of Baal. If you look back at chapter 18 and the Lord consumes um, his offering and the people see the prophets of Baal are false prophets and they put them to death. So like there's a sense of this kind of momentous mo- time in Elijah's ministry, but then Jezebel threatens him and he kind of freaks out and flees mm-hmm. and he's just like, um, so you just see even in the midst of success in ministry, there's still the, he's exhausted, he's worn out, he's sick of it all. It's, it's, it's like he's asking for retirement. It's like, Lord, I'm done. I'm, I'm ready to hang it up. And one of the things you get out of this passage is just the, the psychology of it, of how the Lord ministers to him um, in the midst of his depression, in the midst of his despair, in the midst of his weariness. Do you think there's anything, as you were saying, that's a good point about looking back. Do you think there's anything in, in how we as God's people dwell heavily on the hard times and quickly dismiss the good times because you were saying how God gave him this great victory and then Jezebel beefs him and then he's like, (laughs) I quit. So do you think there's anything in that where we, is that just human nature to go to, to focusing on the negative and missing the positive? Sure. I, I would say so. I'd say that's human nature. I would say it's human nature that we live for. We, we believe the, the, the lie that once this happens, then I'll be good. Mm. You know, once yeah. I get to vacation, once I get the promotion, once my kids get here, once we get there, we think, well, then life is going to be manageable or yeah. peaceful or whatever. And that's just not how life works. Yeah, that's a good point. Tim, what are your thoughts on this? I, you know, I think this is, I think Elijah has forgotten in some respect why he's been successful. He's having this little prideful pity party in the cave, right? Believing he's the only faithful one, mm-hmm. right? And the Lord reminds him, uh, bro, there's 7,000 others that have been just as faithful and have not uh, followed other gods and have been jealous for me as you have. And I think it's interesting that God comes in these powerful demonstrations uh Almost as a reminder, all this that you just experienced, that you talked about on in, uh, chapter 18, you didn't do this. You were my prophet, my representative before the people. And you saw, they saw, this great demonstration of power on my part. And so it's interesting that he, the tremors to his voice coming to Elijah are powerful and mighty and strong. Uh, and, and he's got to wonder, oh my gosh, what's happening? You know, this is, this would freak you out really, you know, you're in the situation in this cave, all this powerful things are happening and you're quickly reminded who's the power behind your ministry. And in this case, Elijah's reminded that it's God and God speaks to him in just a whisper, you know, nothing impressive. Uh, although all that has pre- preceded that has been impressive, uh, to let him know, look, You know, uh, this is the ministry I've called you to. uh, And by the way, you're also going to have your successor uh, who's coming along also. Uh, And so I don't know. I think it's a good reminder for all of us uh, who work in Christ's kingdom to remember, boy, in success, you can really begin to believe you had that part. Mm, And you're, you're the one who gets the credit for the success and forget who it is that led to that victory. Uh, and, and that's what Elijah does is he, he, he maybe gets a little too full of himself. Uh, we see a little bit of as he taunts the people, uh, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's, you know, gone on vacation. Maybe he's away. You know, he has some fun with it. Uh, but maybe there's just a little bit too much of Elijah in it and not enough God, you know. And it seems like one of the reasons we despair is we lose sight of the fact that God is at work and doing far beyond what we can see, right? All he sees at this point is, man, I had this great victory, but what good did it do me? Jezebel's still after me. They're still trying to take my life. And as you pointed out, God reminds him, look, you're not alone. There's 7,000 others. And in fact, 
you're kind of whining about the work. I've already raised up the next prophet to take your place. I've raised up two kings that are going to serve me. Um, God was at work, even though Elijah couldn't see it at the moment. Well, and he sees, right, that great visible demonstration in 18. Why would you not think that this God could help you with Jezebel? One woman, you know, uh, that is, is after you. And you just saw me completely lick up the sacrifice with fire that was saturated with water, you know? But I think that's how we can get, is we can see God in these mighty things, and then in, a, in small things we can forget that it's the same God who was visible there who's present now in this situation. Yeah, and there's a, there's a harshness and a softness to God in this. Like I think in the, in the showing him all the breaking of the mountains is kind of, a, kind of a soft little bit of a backhand saying, don't forget who is who here. I'm God, you're man, stay in your place. But then he, I feel tenderness in the whisper. Like he speaks to him in a whisper, in a low whisper, which like when you speak to someone in a whisper, you're close to them. You have to be close to them so they can hear you. And you're usually saying something personal to them, and it's usually an intimate interaction. And so I see God saying, yeah, I could, Elijah, I could drill sergeant you and smack you back in line and say, quit being a, a baby. But then he goes, no, I've, I've, I understand your suffering. I've called for, like you said, I've, these new kings, these new prophets, because I know you're at your, your, your limit. And so he shows him compassion in there where he, it's that, it's that whole law and gospel back and forth between what God does there. When he, when he could have just said, look, dude, suck it up, get back on the horse, do your job. That's a, that's a great point that he really brings out. And we need to keep in mind both those sides of God. He is mm-hmm. the sovereign Lord of the universe who is not to be treated lightly. And he's the tender father who stoops down when his child is honestly being a little, you know, kind of self-absorbed and mm-hmm. kind of full of himself. You still have the tender, but you have both and we can't let go of one or the other. And I wouldn't necessarily, that's a great point. And I wouldn't necessarily say that Elijah was, wrong in his prayer to God or his words to God? Because I think we pray like that to God all the time. I mean, I know that I do in in complaining to God because I think God wants our prayers to be genuine. And so there will be times where I'm going to pray to God and and God's going to have to go, all right, Mark, your prayer is not necessarily in line with my will. So I'm going to give you a little bit of tough love here. But I think God would favor that over us just not praying or coming to him and being like, all is well, all is good, business as usual, I'm a, you're, and then it just not be real. And I would say commonly what we do is we don't complain to God, we complain to one another, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. And, and which is not a good response. I agree wholeheartedly. And you read the Psalms of Lament, those are actual, absolutely complaints yeah. against God often. But as you point out, God can do something with that. Yeah. Right. God can hear that and begin to redirect and reframe and 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 get our attention and and put it where it needs to be. That's a great point because when we when we complain to each other, rarely does that ever produce good fruit. It usually just stirs up whatever the issue is and makes and just kind of spreads it. But when we complain to God, we're complaining or we're talking to the only one that can truly take a impossible situation and do something fruitful out of it. And, I, and that's, a, that's a wonderful point. I think we should spend more time, something's bothering us, spend more time talking to God about it than necessarily spending only time talking to each other about it. Well, and Elijah too, I mean, the, the, he's not going to have much success. You know, you have these powerful moments, right? And the people will still forget God. They'll still go after Baal. They'll still do all these things. And you can quickly kind of feel as the, prof, the one in the prophetic role, why am I still doing this? What's this about? You know, like, like you think of Noah, right? 120 years of preaching, and there's still only eight on the boat. Mm. You know, it's not real successful, you know? And so that's frustrating, you know? And I think uh, to both your points, it's, it's okay to be frustrated, you know, and to, to vent, give that vent to God. Uh, or to share it in, I would say, a fellowship, a communion of saints who, who are in the journey together, you know, uh, where you can lean on one another through the frustrations. 
And hopefully that community points you back to God's word. Yeah, right. And shares with God's word. And, and just you. reminds you maybe, hey, yeah, this is a sucky season, but hey, we just came off of this. This was good. Let's, you mm-hmm. know, I remember Chad Bird always saying, Israel walks into the future facing backwards, you know, and sometimes we need to remember that is look at all that God has done as you move forward uh, instead of always uh, being so wrapped up in the present or the near future. Uh, and know that this God will deliver. People will react as people react, as they've always reacted throughout history. Uh, and sadly, you know, wonderful things happen, but not everybody converts. and Everybody changes heart. And so... And one takeaway for me is, is when I find myself in circumstances that aren't to my liking, um, the need to, to take my eyes off the circumstances and listen for God's voice. Mm-hmm. You know, to be in His Word and just... Listen for his perspective, for his encouragement, for his truth, realizing the circumstances may or may not change, and I I ought to talk to him about those things. Um, But ultimately, my hope is that I'm hearing God's voice, that he is leading and guiding me, whether the circumstances work out favorably or not. Which is hard to do, to actively set whatever the situation is here and mentally, maybe even physically, step away from it out of the noise of it, and leave it there when there's just this strong desire to resolve it and fix it because it's some kind of issue. And, you know, that is a great motivation to develop the habit of hearing from God when times are good. Mm. When you're not under the gun, when you're not feeling the pressure, when you're not wiped out, just to get in the habit of routinely hearing from God so that when the inevitable hard times come... You're in shape, so to speak. You naturally go back to it. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's it, now God is so gracious. <laughs> for most of us, that's not how it works. For most of us, we neglect, neglect, neglect God's word, and then something happens to get our attention, and now all of a sudden we're interested in what God has to say. Right. The good news is God is gracious, but it can just be a little harder to hear His voice. Right. Sometimes you got to hear some right. earthquakes and some rocks cracking around you, and uh, but but God continues to speak because He's gracious. Yeah. I read some books uh, on vacation by St. Francis de Sales, and that was a, a good part of his was, you know, when you begin in the morning with God in prayer, you look at your day and you think, okay, here are the events of my day, here are the challenges of my day, uh, here's how I'm praying that I might move in the midst of my day. And he talks about when when these things start to spiral, right, like Elijah didn't just get to the cave in a minute. Right, that was a process that led him to the cave. Is he really talks about in in those moments when you feel the spiral coming to detach and try to really just think and consider God and Jesus and and what He has created you to be, what He has asked you to do, and to put your focus on Him so that that spiral might stop. So it kind of snaps you to a little bit of like, okay, uh, I'm starting to drift. I'm starting to spiral. Time to back out for a moment and reconnect with the one who's called me, you know? And I thought, it's like, man, that's a great, great practice. He, he actually uses an example of bouquets. So you, you spend your devotion in that you get a couple gems from your devotion or reading or prayer, and you pull those gems and take them with you as a bouquet, as a fragrance. So when the day gets going and you're like, oh man, I, I wish I was in that peaceful moment I was at at six in the morning or five in the morning. Pull it out, consider it, and let that that fragrance and sweetness return so that you're kind of reset. You know, and I was like, man, that's that's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, great thoughts on that. All right, let's jump ahead to our and then New they Testament. just killed twelve bulls and sacrificed them in birth. And boiled the yolks. Did you notice? <laughs> they had to eat. I never noticed this before. Boiled their flesh with the yolks mm-hmm. of the oxen. Like, am I reading that right? Like, and who were the things that go on their they shoulders? They little, threw in the pot a little as well? aromatic wood in there. I, guess I don't so. know that's what right. that's for. And what people ate it? It's like, and they gave it to the people to eat, or they're just people maybe around just, the field with. I mean, yeah, maybe. Some, maybe it's the seven thousand they're talking about. Oh, well, maybe. Yeah. I don't know, but I don't. Some that's, bold yeah, jerky. that's a good point. With the yolks, and it's very it made a point of saying with the yolks. Yeah. 
Oh, well, another Anybody day. out there cook with wood in the soup? <laughs> Let us know. All right, Galatians fiber. 5. Yeah, fiber there. Galatians 5, verses, it hits verse 1, and then it jumps over the 13 through 25. So that says this. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For we are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the flesh are against the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident: sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before, and that that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one, oh, one too many. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. So this is... Very, very applicable. If you can't put yourself into verse 19 in some way, 19 through what, 21, read it again, read it again, read it again, because it speaks, I mean, this is a, this is a text where we can read it and go, okay, I understand what's going on here. I see this in my life. Um, so Tim, what are your initial thoughts here? Well, I, I, right away, when you went into the reading, that was we're coming off the yoke and uh, the burning of the yoke and bulls uh, as those beasts of burdens are driven by Elisha or Elisha, as some say. Uh, so for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand, form, stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And so back to the verses you highlight, Mark, in, in 19, right? The, these are the things that our old nature is yoked to right? Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rage, or rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things and the like. So uh, until we are liberated through repentance and the forgiveness of sins, uh, we don't know what it's like to be free of these things, you know? So kind of the old Luther bondage of the will, if you will, so for freedom, Christ sets us free so that we can live a life of abundance with love, joy, peace, patience, the fruits of the Spirit, right? Which he says, there is no law. In other words, uh, there is no limit. You, you can't love too much, have too much joy, too much peace, too much patience, too much kindness, too much goodness, too much faithfulness, those sorts of things. Uh, and so... I really like this because it helps us remember what Christ has done for us through Calvary and his resurrection is we are now free to live on this path and to experience these things in greater abundance than we ever have. And also able to identify and to look in the mirror with the law to see I am... <laughs> In my old nature, while I've been set free from these sins, I still often go back and put myself under the yoke of this sin or that sin, right? Which means and, I have a choice. Yeah, right. And so, and then repentance, right, is kind of the, the, the tearing away of this to turn back to him. So you kind of, I, I think, almost to the burn it all, you know, in repentance. Just take the yoke back off and the sin and set it aflame so that you might live in the new way. Uh, and which kind of always echoing back to Alicia, you know, and, right? In the burning of those, which always kind of short circuits me a bit when someone commits some kind of sin, they acknowledge it and they go, "Oh, God and I, God and I have an agreement oh, on this yeah. one." And it's like I don't think God agrees with any bit of sin that you want to do. 
I mean, you may struggle with this thing and it may be hard for you to beat. I get it. I have those own in my own life. But never do I think God looks at it and goes, it's okay, Mark. I know you struggle with cussing or something. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Just we're brothers. We're buddies. Like I think God, like you said, burns it. It's done. It's your old self. You died to it. Every day, work by the Spirit to rid yourself of it. Because there's no amount of sin that God likes. God says, okay, that's cool. It just doesn't happen. God, God's pretty clear on where he stands in relation to your little pet sin. Right. The Spirit is opposed to the flesh. The flesh is opposed. So they are in opposition. Like That's the agreement is the Spirit has agreed. I'm going to oppose that sin as long as you live. I'm going to battle. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to pound it and cut it and slice it. And anything the Spirit can do, he's going to oppose that sin. And to keep you from doing the things you want to do, which points to my sinful nature. Mm -hmm. What do I want to do? How do I run and respond when this this person cuts me? I want to cut back. How do I what do I want to create? I want to create jealousy and then strife and enmity and all that other stuff. That's just my sinful nature. And so if I'm going to be living by the fruits of the spirit, then by gosh, I need the Holy Spirit to enable me to do that. Because if I'm left on my own, I'm stuck in verse 19. Yeah, and you could easily trip into Gnosticism here, right, with the, with the spirit pitted against the flesh. Right. And, and that's why we need to kind of remember that, that this flesh is that old sinful nature, the yoked to sin that will choose sin all the time, right, versus this is not saying your body's bad, spirit good. Right. It's these two forces of the new man versus the old man, and the new man is created to live in freedom, and the old man always returns to Egypt, always returns to the the past idols, to to be yoked to past sins and these sorts of things. And so, uh, but I, I would say too on this that we sometimes forget, I think as Lutherans, is there's a real intentionality for us here you know, to go after these things and to burn these things that that have no place in our lives because it doesn't just happen. And sometimes I think we think, oh, I I heard the forgiveness of sins, so, boy, I wouldn't walk back to, you know, like the dog returning to the vomit, you know. But but I think we need to be very realistic about ourselves and realize, yeah, as soon as they're delivered from slavery in Egypt, they they long for the onions and the leeks and the right. things of of days past. And so, sometimes we can uh, even sinfully sorrow in the sins that we're no longer partaking in. You know, sure, and, and yearn for dangerous. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's it's the interesting the comment of oh I've been forgiven now I'm good and set. Give me five minutes. And I'll show you that I'll return to that vomit. Sure. Because sure. That's, that's, it, that's my sinful nature living outside of the direction of the Spirit. Yeah, and, and the flesh, the sinful flesh, right, is, is driven by pleasure. Sure. You know, and, and the Spirit is driven by the will of God. And, and I think that's where we have to often remember these things because uh, we will always want that which is most pleasurable. And it strikes me that... Uh, what a different understanding of freedom, right? The flesh tells me, mm. um, tying into this whole idea of seeking pleasure, and, and often pleasure is I get to do whatever I want. You know, it's this I'm in control. I am, and it's that, but if you follow your flesh in that way, you will become enslaved to sin, right? The Meaning promise, you need more and more of it. The promise of yeah. the flesh is you deserve to be free. No one should tell you what to do. You should, get, you should just do what you want. And yet following that way of life will enslave you to all those things yeah. that he mentions there. Yeah. You know, when you think about that, we, when we were in Nashville, we, went to the, we like to go to little holes in the wall, and we went to this uh, little hole in the wall, and unbeknownst to us, it was a complete gay bar. You know, I mean, flags everywhere, colors everywhere, and, and Lan and I were the only people, I think, in the place that were not gay. Uh, and I found it interesting because there was a lot of joy in the room, a lot of excitement, lots of laughter, a lot of people having a good time. And I thought, you know, this is how it is for us is we don't realize sometimes that the pleasure and joy that we're living in is our bondage. 
you know. Uh, be, why? Because, well, you can get affirmed from other people, you can get hugs from other people, and, and I'm not trying to just pick out this sin. I just thought this was a good image to me of we can fall prey to this too, is, is I'm living this good life, this is all fun, this is all good, and realize that actually at the root of it I'm in bondage to something. You know, because now I'm having to see everything in the world through that lens. And I have to And define everything by it. And that bondage has to keep feeding me in some way. Oh, yeah. Like if it's taking one of the things here, if it's sexual immorality, well, once I dip into that, there's that false pleasure that I feel. But then I have to, if that's where I'm focused, I have to keep going back to that well and keep going back to doing that so that it continues to feed that need of mine which is totally different from when we look at the fruits of the spirit and the things that come from there, God feeds us those things. And that's an un, I look at that as a, uh, there's no bottom to that well, or there's Mm -hmm. no limit to that. God just keeps pouring that grace onto us. Whereas the earthly other things we have to keep going after. And if we chase those things, let's be real about it. It's going to damage our life going to damage our relationships it's going to our life it may look good initially it may feel good initially but then give it some time and it's going to look like a complete train wreck of just disease and mess and all kinds of darkness that has been veiled as light it has and, been veiled and as one bitterness. reason for that is the way your brain is wired sure so i think you were headed there in terms of i go into the sin it makes me feel good but over time, doing the same thing, I don't feel quite as good. Yeah. So now I need to do more of that to kind of get the same shot of pleasure. Um, and that, too, is a bottomless well in the sense of you always have to keep doing a little more, a little more, a little more. Yeah. Again, this is how addictions form, yeah. right? Which will lead you to what you're describing there. Yeah. What, what began as a source of pleasure um, will become a curse. Sure. And, and I in think- contrast to what you said at the beginning, though, there's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. The more we get of love and joy and peace, it just multiplies, mm-hmm. and it just grows, and it, it becomes more fulfilling, more satisfying. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, when, when temptation comes, right, there is that natural uh, pleasure that is kind of activated in the temptation, you know? And since we have the Spirit now and our only in bondage, we can recognize that moment. You know, there's this, this split moment of realizing, here's a temptation, there's a pleasure, will I dive into it, or will I maybe exercise self-control, or, or whatever it is. Uh, and and I, I thought about this when we were on, like, Broadway, like, it was we were there like for one afternoon was it and we never really went back. I mean, it was like butt cheeks hanging out of shorts all over the place. I mean, just kind of just almost debauchery in some some regards, you know. And I we hadn't well, I had never been there before, nor had Claire. Uh Leanne had gone for a work thing before, but it was like why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> you know, like and then it, it, w- it was so common, it was almost just like numbing, you know? It was just like, wow, like no matter where you saw, where you looked, that's what you were going to see. And it eventually you know? makes your brain toxic. Oh, yeah, eventually, yeah. It's, it's and it's like, like why, why right. even spend any more time on this road, right. Right. you know? Like, but rarely do you, say, do you hear someone say, God, this, this day has been so joy-filled, I just need tomorrow to be awful. I can't handle this joy anymore. It's just too peaceful. Mm-hmm. There's too much peace. We need to have some My relationships tomorrow. are too good. Yeah, it just doesn't <laughs> happen. It doesn't happen. One, one last thought, um, verse 13 there, in terms of the purpose of our freedom. You know, America, we obviously highly value freedom. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about our freedom and our rights, and um, some people are concerned about the government encroaching on those rights or other groups encroaching on those rights. And I think it can be, one, as Americans, I think we rightly value freedom as a highly prized sure. possession. Um, but just a reminder, verse 13 tells us, but that freedom is given to us for a purpose, which is through love to serve one another. Yeah. Ultimately, the freedom is not, I've been set free now to do whatever I want to do, but now that I'm free, 
I turn and use that freedom to love others. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I was reading something recently brought to mind when you said that was where, where we will often argue that, well, the outcome was good, even though I had to use sin to get to that outcome. Well, I got it, it, it accomplished. It ultimately worked out in the end. Yeah, but you had to use sin to get there. So the end justifies the means. Right. So the, God, right. never does God go, well, it's okay that you um, ran over that person with your car. You did get your meeting faster. And it's a stupid example, but <laughs> committing sin to get to some potential positive outcome is never okay. That's never, that may not be where you're going, but that's what came to mind when I was thinking about yep. that. It led me to think back too to the Elijah passage in 1 Kings 19 was how many people today do we hear on Facebook that seem like they're the only righteous Christian in the world? Yeah. You know what I mean? And then they just bang on everybody else. And it's like, I, I keep thinking of Christ's mission to come, not to condemn, but to save. You know, this is the season of salvation. So we ought to be pouring out the love of God. And something you say a lot, David, that's, uh, that I really like is there's a new and different, better story, right? And, and this is a story and a path that we of our own humanity could not know had not our maker revealed it to us, mm -hmm. that, that this is the way of freedom, that this is the way of bondage. And had he not revealed that to us, the maker of all of us and our humanity, we wouldn't know that this is the better life, right. you know? And so, yeah, it kind of led me to think of that as maybe not to bark on Facebook at people, but to show them a different way, yeah. Yeah. you know? That this is what it, I think it's an affirmative apologe, an apologetic, you know. So we're not just the naysayers of don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, but live more of this life. Yeah, and when have has, more of this life. <laughs> when has barking at someone on social media ever accomplished anything? <laughs> Nothing. So Nothing. one one quick comment on the power of culture to influence us. So whenever I read five one for free for freedom, Christ has set us free. When I say freedom. I can't read that without hearing William Wallace scream freedom in part. So <laughs> careful what movies freedom. you watch. They might stay with freedom. you. Freedom. Yes. I watched that movie recently. It's a fantastic. Movie. Three hours. It's a long one. We just split it up. It's a great one. All right. Let's look at our gospel text. This will be the sermon text on Sunday as well. So Luke 9, 51 through 62. And it says this. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Boy, you really see a lot in 57 through 62 that are echoing the king's reading don't you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i like though how this <laughs> this section starts hey we've got the big guns on our side jesus they didn't like you so can you go ahead and just burn them all up yeah the like, sermon text is just this first section not not the cost of following jesus which misses the whole point of like jesus came to bring peace yes. not to bring wrath wrath's going to come on the last day but today is a day of put your faith in me and I'll redeem you. Well, and they're recalling, right, a, a moment that Elijah did that, called mm, fire down yeah. from heaven, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, and, and it's interesting how offended they get when the one that they're rejecting is Jesus. Right. You know? But it's, it's all throughout the Gospels, Jesus gets, Jesus could get offended and get affronted and, and kick back countless times. But we see that Jesus is here for a mission, and his mission is to walk to the cross. And so during that, he knows he's going to get kicked, whipped, stabbed, prodded, whatever. I mean, he took more of a beating than any of us will ever take during our life, and yet he maintained his composure. He never dipped into sin. 
and he continued to walk towards the cross. Yeah, if Jesus was about Jesus, he'd be offended and angry all the time. Sure. Right? But his sole purpose is a selfless purpose, and it's for the salvation of humanity. Yeah. You know? Uh, and this is why the James and John get a little fired up, right? They, they take a personal affront to this rejection, right? Uh, and Jesus will later say in John's gospel, right, is, hey, it's me that they're rejecting, not you, you know? Uh, this passage in particular really highlights his, his mission or his purpose, right? Um, verse 51, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And if I remember correctly, I think they are in far, 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 far north Israel, Peter's confessed Jesus is the Christ. Um, there's been a couple of other events, but I think he's pretty far north when when we get to this point, and, and Jerusalem would be to the south on the other side of Samaria. Mm-hmm. But in it, isn't it interesting? So Luke wants us to know he's made the turn. He has mm-hmm. now f- set his face to Jerusalem. Now, for Jesus, that means the cross. Yeah. It, it, the time is now. I'm, I'm headed to Jerusalem to fulfill my mission, but the Samaritans, that's why they're offended. Not because they understand the cross, but because he's associating himself as an Israelite going to Jerusalem, and we don't have anything to do with the Jews because they hate us, and it's gone back and forth. Yeah, this goes all the way back to the two kingdoms split, right? right. There, right. Oh, yeah. Where yeah. they established their temple in Mount Gerizim. And so for the Jew, would always have to go through Samaria or on the outskirts of Samaria. But every time they kind of cut through it, right, to the Samaritan, it's like, you don't have the real temple, we have the real temple. You know, and what's fascinating here is Jesus, the temple, the word, is the one being rejected and moving through, right. you know. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, this there's years of hostilities between the Jews and the Samaritans, which are kind of a remnant of the, the pagans, probably Assyrian pagans and whatever, survived the, the, the fall of the northern kingdom, and they established their capital as Samaria and their own temple. Right. Right. And sadly, I think we still see this today in our world. Like, I've heard people disagree with our government and say, we really need to pray for God's wrath on our president because he's just not a Christian. And that makes me immediately cringe and say, what? Like, Jesus didn't go to the disciples. Yeah, you're right. Lord, Father, burn them up. No, he rebuked them. He said, no, 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 that's not the right way you should be thinking. Yeah, yeah, everyone repent. But I'm, not, I'm coming calling for repentance, not coming to burn people up because they won't repent. And today in the world, I think we can get that mixed up and we can, we can make real deafening assertions about people we don't really know personally, like government leaders, and say, Mm -hmm. clearly not a Christian, so they need God's wrath. And it's like, first of all, until you sit down and have a cup of coffee with this guy, how do you know he's clearly not a Christian, or how do you know she's clearly not following God's will? And that's, I think that's where we can become like these disciples sometimes, and then, well, God's going to humble you in that moment then, Mm. because you're getting off track. That's a good word. So other thoughts on this? One thought, just to play the other side of it for a moment, um, James and John weren't entirely wrong. Mm. God will judge sin. Sure. There is an end time accounting, but their timing was way off, as you right. well pointed out, <laughs> right? But like they did, and I would say the other thing is, they did understand that Jesus at any moment could call down mm armies of angels, and wipe them all out. Like, they had faith in Jesus, they understood God was serious about sin, but still they didn't understand he'd set his face to Jerusalem to go to yeah. a cross, right? They, Aren't they also the sons of thunder? They are, yeah. You see clearly how they got their nickname here, the sons of thunder. I kind of like that, sons Explain of thunder. That one. Explain that one for our listeners. Well, I, you know, the, the, I think the sons of thunder title is kind of speaks to their personality, as brothers, uh, you know, they're kind of, they're always ready to go hard and kind of come down heavy mm. and all this sort of stuff. And, and here they are wanting to call down the, the fire of heaven to smite these people who have not welcomed them with hospitality in Samaria after thousands of years of division between the two, you know. Uh, 
And, and, and to David's point is, you know, this is, and to your point earlier, Mark, is this is the season of salvation, you know? Uh, if, if they remain in this rejection, either at death or at the second coming, well, then there's a fire prepared, mm-hmm. you know? But our mission now is to work tirelessly to point to Christ crucified and risen for sinners mm-hmm. until that day comes. Right. You know, uh, and, and I think this is what we forget as you were talking about people who just, you know, damn the president and curse him. And, you know, like this is the season to be praying for the president, mm-hmm. hoping that if his heart is awry, that the spirit convicts and he turns as we hope it happens amongst ourselves and in our own community. And uh, I, I don't know, I just really feel like there's so, there's so much being missed today in terms of the person of Jesus. Jesus is a man and became man. Think about how you're talking as if he's sitting right here. Yeah. And imagine it. You know, yes, it's an exercise of imagination, but then the fact is, is he is omnipresent and is present everywhere. So he is there. But if you need to, give him flesh in your mind's eye. And then talk and look look to his brown eyes. You know, I'm guessing he has brown eyes if he's Middle Eastern maybe. Uh, and think, how is he moving to my talking? Yeah, what is his you know? facial expression? Mm-hmm. Just yeah. as nonverbals when I'm doing or saying what I'm. I doing did. Or saying. I just got. I just practiced that last night for the first time, and and like imagine him sitting in bed beside me, and then reading these psalms and passages, and I was like, it was kind of eerie. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like, <laughs> yeah, that was me. You know, like I'm the one who did this or I said this, and I was like, I mean, it really brought it to life in such a way. And this is why why I'm going back to the person of Jesus is because. If Jesus just remains this doctrinal abstraction, and it's just about our being right and Joe being wrong or whatever, we miss the humanity of it all. Which, and we miss the mission. Which goes back to what David was saying back in the Old Testament discussion is, we need to step back from a situation mm. and consider God on that situation. Because when we're in the heated moment of something, it's just my flesh that's just driving it. But when I step back, I calm down, I take a breath, and then I consider God's will on this. It changes my perspective. It changes how I'm going to act, and it changes how I'm going to treat my my fellow man. Um, yeah. If I just go in hot, guns a-blazing, it's always going to end up a mess. Yeah. How, how, is, how is that helping draw your brother or sister to Christ? Right. It's like I'm gonna I'm gonna convince you of my way with a hammer. Mm-hmm. When has that ever worked? When has it ever worked to to convince me by smacking me? Try never. Yeah. <laughs> never. never. <laughs> so, any other final thoughts on this, David? Well, uh, this is somewhat related to the Galatians passage, but as you describe James and John and, and sons of thunder and calling down wrath from heaven, uh, what a testimony to. Uh, the work of the Spirit, like we saw in Galatians 5, because John writes the little letter of 1 John. Major theme throughout 1 John is love, love one another. And there's an apocryphal story about John. It's not in the Bible, but he's he's the one disciple that lived to to an old age. He'd heard news of Paul and Peter being martyred and many others being martyred. He'd seen a lot. But the apocryphal story says at the end of his life, when he could barely speak, people would still come see him, and, and, and he would just say, love one another. That's, he'd just say it over and over, just love one another, love one another. So mm-hmm. it just seems like the Spirit continued to do a good work in John's life, that he reached a point where rather than calling down judgment, he was simply calling people to love one another. Yeah, yeah something I was reading to that point is, is love and, and uh, selflessness or humility the combination of those two is the the fountainhead or the uh, headwaters for all virtue. You know, when you really think about it, love in terms of a right-oriented love, not some of what the world calls love today, but a love of God and neighbor and a selflessness will always lead to good virtues toward others, mm-hmm. you know. 
Uh, yeah. Good stuff. Good conversation. We went long today because it's good stuff. Sometimes these the, what we cover here in Scripture is just hard to be brief on. So hopefully our listeners, those of you out there listening, enjoyed this discussion. If you have any questions, um, send them in. I think yesterday we actually, in our You Ask, We Answer, we actually discussed a first question that crossed over from a Sunday preview. So mm. interesting to do that. So if you have questions on this, email them in to me, mark.bray at McKinney. Dot org, and we'll add those to our other podcasts and talk about them there. So thanks for joining us. And, and Tim, before your next vacation, we're going to introduce you to this thing called TripAdvisor. I will tell <laughs> you, you about different dive I, bars I and <laughs> places. I it's that. a great tool. Did you not look it up on TripAdvisor before you went? <laughs> or Yelp? Or you something? know me. I drove by. I was like, that looks like a cool hole in the wall. I should have known by the name. So if y'all know about TripAdvisor out there, come tell Tim about it. All right, y'all have a great week. We'll see you on Sunday.